helping you get patents using 10 years of USPTO patent insider expertise. I used to be the guy that stamped the patents at the patent office for 10 years, telling you whether you get one or not. Now I'm helping you with that experience so you can get through the process. All right, here we go. So we've talked about the four fundamental steps of the patent process. That's pretty much what we've been doing in these videos, trying to give you a fundamental foundation that will help you. Um, and so we've talked about the first three. Right now we're still on the third one, which is dealing with the non-provisional utility application. We're in the what's called, um, I said three parts, and so we're kind of still in that second part of the three. Um, which is kind of, I didn't want the video to be too long, but the examination and patent prosecution process. So basically, uh, we decided that when you first submit your application to the patent office, what happens is that you, uh, once they get back to you, because it's a long line, unless you pay to skip the line, you, usually the wait is about 18 months, sometimes a little bit more, 24 months, but the PTO post averages on their website, so it may change after this video comes out, but basically, right now it's about 18 month average. And so what basically happens is you get an opinion for the examiner. They're gonna take your invention, their application, they're gonna search it, they're gonna have their team of specialists, their army of searchers, basically see if they can find something that exists just like it. Is it an exact copy? They're gonna be asking themselves three questions. Is your idea useful? Or is it just a whole bunch of stuff you made up It doesn't make any sense? So is it useful? If they think it's useful, then you're good. If they don't think it's useful, you'll get what's called a one-on-one -on -one rejection. Okay, they're gonna ask, is it an exact copy of what came before it? Is there something I can find that's basically dead, a dead ringer for your invention? If they think so, you'll get a one-on-two rejection. If they can't find that, you don't get a one-on-two rejection. So, uh, and then the third thing they're gonna be asking uh, is, is it non-obvious? Meaning, is your idea just putting two things together that are well known. So if you say, oh look, I have a camera on my phone. Now I have this phone that is a video camera on the phone. Well, it's already a camera on the phone. Cameras are known to be video and still with the technology that's out there, that's not really an invention. That's just an obvious combination what's already in existence. Now if you're talking about actual new technology, a new type of camera, and you're developing that camera and it is an improvement of what previously existed, then maybe yes. But if it's just saying I just put took a phone that just had a steel camera and now I gave it capability for a video camera but I didn't invent anything, I just used technology that there's, there's already that capability in the phone but it just wasn't being used, that's that's not that's just obvious. That's not something that you get a patent for. And then, you know, the, the last thing that you need to be concerned about that's gonna the examiner's gonna look at is are you compliant with the standards? Are the drawings compliant with the standards? Is your legal language, is all the drafting of the application compliant with the standards set by the patent office? If they don't find anything wrong with the way you've written everything, great. If they find something, then you'll get what's called a 112 rejection. So, when that happens, what do you do? A lot of people freak out. They're like, oh my God, I got a rejection. That's normal. Expect a rejection. If you don't get one, <laughs> don't be too happy about that because it may mean something's wrong. But just, uh, if you get the rejection, take a deep breath, call me or whoever you have representing you. And then basically they'll let you know, they'll read through it, they'll give you a professional opinion because sometimes the word rejection just sounds horrible. Like, oh crap, I got a rejection, what is that? But it's not that bad, it's just saying, okay, look, sometimes you can read through an office action and what it's actually saying to someone that, like me that understands it is saying, you actually have a really great idea here. I think it's patentable, but you need to fix some things. We don't like the way you, you wrote your claims here. We think you need to make some amendments. Uh, and you need to clean up some other language here. You can't really use that language in this. We don't like that. If you make that compliant, you might have a, a patent. And so it's really a conversation. It's just a legal conversation. So the way you have this legal conversation is actually, unfortunately, you have to use the word rejection, objection. Those are kind of painful words to hear, but in reality, they're just part of a conversation of a process. So what can we do in response? Well, what we can do first, we can have an interview. We can call the examiner. Say, hey man, why did you give me rejection? No, no, not that kind of conversation, but you're saying, look, we read your exa uh, rejection examiner. We understand where you're coming from. Basically what we would like to do, 
we propose that we solve your problems that you presented in this manner. What do you think, examiner? Examiner says, well, I like the way you propose this, how to get over this 102, but I don't think it's going to help you with the 103 because this other reference I put in the, in the office action, um, that kind of meets these things. So you may need to dig a little deeper. I did see something in the specification that, that I couldn't find. You know, you might want to go that route, uh, but talk to your client and see if that's fine. Uh, but I think you're on the right track here. That's a great interview. So now we propose something that we see, does the examiner accept it? So we kind of get a preview of what we're going to get when we file again, which is called an amendment. So the patent office allows you to amend your application. Now this is very, very, you have to be very careful here because an amendment, you cannot add what's called new matter. Meaning I can't add something that didn't exist in the original filing of the application. This is why, this is where a lot of people that I know that will, inventors or companies or startups that are trying to save money and try to do it themselves, this is where they get messed up. Because they think in their mind, they have the idea in their head the entire time. So just because I didn't put something in the application, that's still the idea. I mean, I sent the name of it. That's what I've been doing for the last year. What do you mean it doesn't count? That's why it's very important to understand the law. Because you can be in a situation where you, because you've named your company or named your product or described it in a certain way, but you omit something that's very essential, and then you want to add it later, you can't do it. You might be in a, in a, in a situation where your, your ignorance of the law has caused you to miss out on getting a patent. And that's when it really is bad. So uh, I'm, I'm telling you this because, I mean, you know, so, um, maybe a, a, some, you know, patent practitioners may charge you a, a bunch of money to, to share what I'm sharing with you. But I do this to try to make sure that you, you get your, your money's worth, you get your value out of whoever you hire. Uh, hopefully it's me, but if not, at least you get the information so you can make an informed decision. So, you, we, we talk about what you do. We say that you have an interview, you want to talk to the examiner, talk through the rejections, the objections, the office action, you want to draft a response. Hopefully you have a proposed response you talked about during that interview, and you come back and you talk about your strategy. What's most important? Do I want to get a patent right now? Do I want to kind of really push the examiner on what is my technology? I don't think the examiner is really appreciating my technology, so I want to kind of draw a line in the sand here. So you have options on how you respond. It's more of an art than a science, but you want to make sure that you do it in a way that's not combative, that you do it in a way that's uh, respectful. And uh, one of the language we always like to use is uh, examiner respectfully disagrees or uh, applicant respectfully disagrees. This is really just a respectful disagreement, what they used to call a gentleman's argument. Uh, you're really not trying to uh, win, so to speak. You're just trying to be, you want to win on the merits of your idea. You don't want to win because you were the more awful negotiator because then you end up with a patent that's not really worth anything because it really wasn't valid. Um, and that's another conversation we'll talk about in a future video. So basically this, this part is basically just saying, how do I respond? So we talked about that. You have an interview with the examiner. You go over everything. First, you meet with your practitioner. Hopefully you've hired a practitioner by this point. If not, we have another video for that. Uh, let me know in the comments if you have any questions or things you'd like me to talk about further, give scenarios. Again, this is my this is what I've done for now over 11 years. Uh, uh, kind of breathe this stuff. And I'm doing this to kind of help you. I mean, I've done a lot of consultations with um, inventors and startups over, I guess, the last year or so. And I, I, I realized the need for information like this so that you can get a clear understanding of what's going on. So with that being said, you know, keep keep following us. We're going to release another video. It goes more into the uh, the latter parts of this process, and then uh, finally the fourth step.